Hey everybody, what's up? It's your girl Different and welcome to Different World YouTube channel. I hope you all out there having a wonderful day like your girl. And if not, manifest, plan, and prepare for a better one because I guarantee you all, it's surely coming to you guys for sure. And if this is your first, second, third time, or more to my YouTube channel, welcome. Happy to have you guys. And before you leave, don't forget, hit that subscribe button and that notification bell so when I drop content, you guys come into Different World and you come and learn about your girl, yeah? And speaking of coming and learn about your girl, I'm an author, motivator speaker, travel influencer, content creator, and CEO of my own small business, Third Eye Entertainment LLC, a business that strives to bring social awareness to society through our products and services in which we educate, inspire, and entertain all at once. So again, first, second, third time or more, it don't matter, baby. Just hit the subscribe button for your girl, yeah? All right, you guys, today's Wednesday, hump day, the first Wednesday of the year, 2024. So you guys know uh, the first week of uh, January, I want to give you guys uh, every day dropping some content just to give you guys something. On Wednesdays, you guys know we do our podcast collaborations, and so this one's going to be one that I did with the uh, gentlemen of the After Five, the podcast uh, with Ali and Lord Shu. Had such a great time conversing with these two uh, black kings. Um, uh, also, I had a, um, an invite back to them, so I'm going to be doing another interview follow-up with them. And so looking forward to that for Black History Month. So guys, be uh, going to be a look out for that. Uh, well, with that being said, uh, without me further yip yap and enjoy Jack, and you guys know how we do with my podcast interviews. We talk about all kinds of topics, including my book, What If a Controversial Paradigm Shift. I think with this conversation, we just, you know, shoot the breeze. I shared my testimony, of course. Uh, wherever I go, I advocate for mental health awareness, and so we definitely talk about that. Um, I can't remember. Um, it's been a while. We did this uh, last year, if you will, back in 2023. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and re and listen to this audio interview with you guys. So check it out. And when we come back, we'll talk about a little bit more of what's going on in different world and um, everything else. Yeah, here it is. Come and learn. Back to another episode of After Father Podcast. It's your man's Lord Shu. Today, we are having a special guest on our channel. We are doing a, you know, good interview. I want to uh, say what's up to my man's Ali in the cut. What up, what up? What's going on, fam? How you doing, man? Doing all right. You know, getting ready for the weekend. And excited to hear about this guest we got. For real. Yeah. A story. So we got basically another polymath for y'all, someone who has many hats. But um, not only that, they are a small business owner of Third Eye Entertainment. We have different. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Yes, Gibson is her name. <laughs> and different is her name. First of all, I want to know how did that name come about? Uh, an identity crisis? I don't know. <laughs> well, first of all, shout out to everybody out there listening and watching. Yes, my name is Different, spelled D I F E N R T. Big shout out to Ali and Lois Shu for having me on my podcast. Happy to be here and share my story and inspire you guys and have fun with your boys. But yeah, um, answer your question i guess it's you know like a little identity crisis uh you know everybody goes to that stage of like who am i what what does this mean to me and um but my name my government name which i don't like to share because uh, i like privacy um i was one of those that'd be up to like two three o'clock in the morning googling my name <laughs> and still could come up with it and so just after thinking about it it was like you know after what i've been through and, and, and people of you know my caliber and People of my generation just didn't think like how I was thinking. Not to say that I'm, I'm better than above anybody. I just realized, you know, I, I'm, I'm different from all the rest and, and sort like, you know, I'm, I'm, everybody says that I'm cut from a different cloth, and that may be true. But for when I, I say different for me, um, it's not a vanity, it's a humility. It's, it means to be different from who you were than your past. You know, I made a lot of mistakes. And, you know, wasn't, you know, I don't, I'm not saying like a bad person in the past, but, you know, I'm better than I was before. And so that's, for me, when I say they're different, I'm, I'm different from who I was in my past. I'm a better person. So that's what it means now. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's dope. <laughs> yeah, I like that. So um, I know uh, as we uh, exchange your emails, you said that you hope that you can come on here and talk about your travels. But first, I just want to talk a little bit about um, mental health. You say you advocate for mental health. So uh, you seem like you have a 
positive attitude, good personality? Like, how how did you, what's your journey in mental health to get to that point? You have to. Now, don't be afraid. Unless you don't let this little cute little face fool you. Now, I got a dark side. I ain't afraid to show it now. But no, um, I guess it's just the that's charity. We always just looking at you know the silver lining in the sky. But um, just just I always had that mindset. You know, I'm never gonna let nobody take what they didn't give me, and that's my joy. And and, and I've been to that point in my life to where I used to let people's thoughts and opinions about me dictate my life. That was in my early twenties. I'm 32 now. And so I'm in, uh, you know, a different book, book three, volume two. And it's all about, you know, self-love and, and loving others and uplifting others. I realized, you know, I can help myself by helping others. When I help others, it, it comes back to me. So putting positive energy out there into the universe, it'll come back to you. I'm a firm believer in what you put out comes back to you. So as well as there's more in the tongue. So what you speak out into your mouth comes into existence so i'm very careful in particular on what i say and what i let come out my mouth and i always just chose to to let words of beauty and positive affirmations come out my mouth you know even if i don't feel it in that time frame you know it's still if i always say if you can't be positive then be quiet don't don't speak on anything negative it's all right to be real about what you're going through but just don't be negative about it because there's power in the tongue and um, I, I live by the mantra, manifest, plan, prepare. And I'll explain that love better on. That's my, that's my motto with Third Eye Entertainment. And so that is just, just a part of who I am. You know, I've always, I, I won't say like, you know, I'm not a religious person. I don't go to church, but I do believe in God. And I'm more so a spiritual person. And so that's part of that as well, just being, you know, positive. And don't get it twisted, you know, everything ain't always sweet. I go through trials and tribulations just like everybody else. I choose. It's a choice. You have to just remember it's a choice. You can choose to be happy in the good and the bad times and just live your life no matter what or you can let life dictate to you no matter you know what the situation is. And I just decided to make that choice. You know, this is my life. I'm going to take them lows like a boss and I'm going to keep a smile on my face. I'm never going to let them see me cry. <laughs> I like that. that. We can identify. It does. I mean, I identify a lot with what you just said. I mean, that was a very powerful statement, you know. I'm very deep into manifestation in the universe, and I, and I thought it was unique. And I can't get more about that. Huh? What was you say? I, I said that I'm happy to see our people. You know, I'm, I'm I don't want to, you know, isolate uh, anybody, but you know, mm-hmm. it seems to me our, our people, you know, black people, being more open about, you know, being in tune with, you know, our spiritual side and talking about chakra healing and manifestation. You know, back in the day, or person like me coming up in a deep fried country south uh anybody you know talking about spiritual things is automatically thinking of voodoo especially about black women you know you also you get pegged with you know thinking oh especially if you know you like the texas and new orleans it's kind of like you know yeah, close by, so. yeah and have you ever heard that little saying was that oh, she must have put a curse on a voodoo curse on mm-hmm. yeah I grew up in Arkansas, so my grandmother yeah. told me a whole yeah. lot, a lot of stories yeah. and, and stuff so about it. Talk about that, and it, but I, I, I don't deal with any of that. Only thing I'm into is the chakra healing manifestations. I do believe in astral projection, and as well as you know yoga and just just better stuff from the inside out. And so I used to be afraid to talk about that, but now you know that I start to take my power back and talk about it. I've noticed that I'm not alone with it, especially seeing black men as well talking about it. I, I love seeing things like that. So kudos to you. Thank kudos. you. Thank you. And, you know, you, you spoke on mental health. One would argue, and, and I would make the argument that, you know, religion and not any particular, but religion as a whole, as a whole. I think it's part of the reason why yeah. a lot of us blacks have a... Uh, Mental health issues. Indeed. I won't say religion. I'll say the church house. The church. <laughs> <laughs> uh, definitely in my past, with my childhood coming up, I definitely was uh, grew up in the church or being close to God. And, and uh, definitely being in the black churches is what kind of in, in the beginning drew me away from God because I feel like that was a block in me to, to try to see God, but then when I show up to church, you know, you got to be your best dress. Everybody's judging you and looking at you, how you win, how you acting, you know, going so to and who and that. It was just, it was too much of a distraction. So that's why I had to step away from the church and, and lose religion in order to gain a relationship with God. 
And there's no knock to to it. The church there are some good churches like everything. Now, I just I, I, I mean I, in my opinion, it's not many it's not many, but I mean there are some people that's out there doing the, the right thing. It, it's a it was a, was it a commercial or it was something on social media I was listening to the other day and it made a lot of sense. Uh says the guy and his wife went to church and uh, his cell phone went off during the middle of the service. The preacher scolded him. Everybody looked at him and shrugged his nose. Like, how could he do such a thing? He should have known better. His wife got on his case. Like, how could he not turn his cell phone off while the preacher was preaching? And it went off. And the man really felt bad and low because everybody just talked about him and cut him deep. So what he did, he was feeling so depressed. He left, uh, went home, went to a bar, thinking about what happened in church that day. And doing, while he was sitting at the bar, he knocked over a beer, and the beer fell, hit the floor, glass broke. A waitress came over, mopped it up. He was like, I'm so sorry and everything. And she pat him on the back, and the manager came out, gave him another drink, and said, hey, it's okay. Everybody make mistakes. You know, you just spill the beer. You know, no big deal. And he's been going to that bar ever since. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, the moral of the story was, you know, the church, you got to treat people with respect, kindness, and forgiveness if you want them. He never went back to church, but he's been going to that bar faithfully ever since. Amen, You know, I don't know. Maybe that's what happened. Things like that that will drive you away. So you're right. We have to practice love and kindness to everybody. You never know what somebody's going through mentally on the inside. And I can tell you, for one, uh, it was those people who used to, you know, share kind words to me coming up that got me through it. Because I was a person, you know, who was silently on the edge. Like, I was ready for somebody to push me in high school. I don't know how I made it through. Oh, well, I made it through listening to the uh, Lauren Hill, Miss Education of Lauren Hill album. That's how I made it through. Right. But about that album and, you know, uh, words of encouragement from counselors and, you know, people feeling sorry for me, if you will, it, it got me through it. You know, it let me know that it was going to be all right. And so when you say mental health and, and, and what led me to getting it in check for, for me, I guess, you know, getting into it with my childhood. Um, I had a pretty good upbringing, and, you know, up until the time I was around 11, and then, you know, life happened and ended up homeless, you know, for three years with my family literally, literally living from pillow to post, you know, sleeping anywhere from cars, shelters, bus stops, you know, strangers' houses, family relatives, you know, parks, even at one point slept at a crack house. And it stayed like that for me for three years, man, and, and it was hell. But some have to where I like to consider it now, you know, a blessing in disguise. You know, at age 14, I was secretly placed in foster care by a, a relative, a family member, and they, none of my other family members knew where I was for the past six months. And, and I tried my hardest to come home, you know. my just was like in 2005, just before I phone hit. So <laughs> you don't know anybody's number, mind you. Still doing LimeWire downloads and everything. Like, like I wasn't doing it either. Shout out to LimeWire, man. <laughs> right, Nick, and all that. But, the um, DJs. Just at that peak, and so I, I, I didn't know anybody's number, so it wasn't like I could call them and write up that number of numbers. But uh, um, it was six months, you know, uh, until they found me. But then by that time, I had found out from another foster kid that if you stayed in and aged out in the state of Texas, they pay for your tuition college. And so Right then and there, I had to use my book smarts and, you know, just to elevate my street smarts, excuse me, use my street smarts to elevate my book smarts and just make that decision to, hey, it's, it's going to be a sucky situation, but I'm going to do the next four years in the system so that I can have an opportunity to go to college. And that's just what I did. And wow. shuffled around. It's remarkable of, of you to even think like that. You know, most teenagers that I see now wouldn't have had that foresight. Because no. even though you was going through... I mean, I couldn't imagine a, a rough time. You you've been homeless, and you go in crack houses. You in foster care, but you still in your mind. You still thinking, I got a future. If I can do something, I can flip this. I can go forward out of this. You you didn't take a victim mentality and say, Well, you know, I ain't gonna be nothing. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to drugs. I'm gonna give up and anything. So salute to you for that and having that mind. I mean, I'm very impressed by that. Yeah, same. Well, I had no choice, to be honest with you, man. Coming up in, you know, Fifth Ward, Texas, in Houston, that's oh, the yeah. do or die neighborhood. It's silent but deadly. 
And so at age 11, I had to grow up, man. I had to, you know, toughen up. I had to be tough. I, I was a Girl Scout. <laughs> I used to jump real hard and everything, and I just I had to get tough. And, you know, my stature, I'm short, and so people like to play with me. And, you know, coming up, you know, being openly developed at a young age and, you know, having ass and titties, you know, for 11 and 12-year-old girls and like grown men, you know, that was a scary situation. So what I would have to do is, you know, walk to school, and, and there was one – point to where I had a guy who was following me and his children was like, hey, baby girl, you need a ride to school? And like, was just get following me. And so I just made that decision, like, you know, I'm not going to be nobody, you know, little punk. If anybody's going to try to mess with me, they're going to have to work for this. And so what I did was I went into the little corner store and bought, you know, a little switchblade. And there on out, you know, I just started, you know, coming to school. I didn't go into the school with the weapon. It wasn't my intention to, you know, come to school with weapons. It was just for protection to and from school. So what I would do is I would carry the weapon to school and before I go into the school, I'd hide it in a little place stashed outside somewhere. And then when I come out of school, I'd pick that, that weapon up or a little switch plate up and just put it in my pocket and ride the bus home. But it stayed like that was one of the main reasons why I made that decision to go into foster care because I was tired of what I was going through, man. You know, sleeping pillow to post, it sucked, man. And, and as a child, you know, seeing that and, and, and learning the adult ways at a young age, it, it does something to you, you know. Uh, you, you brought something, and I, I spoke on this before, and it's one of the things that burned me up, that children, most of these children are getting kicked out for weapons and guns, and we see the aftermath of that on, you know, yeah. on TV and everything. I don't understand why in the hell a police can be on a damn interstate looking for every black brother or whatever that can carry drugs, but yet you can't be on the block looking at kids going back and forth to school. You got time to do every damn thing else but protect children. Why? Even if we have to hire, hire I think we brought that up with Rob, private security. Yeah, there is no yeah. excuse why our children can't go to school and have a safe passage there and back. Exactly. This is the reason why they have to join gang. Well, I know why. It's by design. But yeah. This is the reason you've got to understand why children join gangs, why children are carrying guns and weapons and everything. They don't want to have to do this, do that shit. But they're threatened. They're afraid. And, 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 you know, and, and they don't have parents right. Or parents is trying to work and make a living while the kids got to go off. And some kids getting up at four, at five o'clock in the damn morning, yeah. dark trying to catch buses and stuff yeah. nowadays and, you know you better not have a big sister or brother and parents can't afford to be there with them or they don't have a relative and they off by, they, by themselves this is ridiculous yeah and, and that's, that's just the life code and like you said it's the system designed that way but i will say this is houston i guess that's what they decided to put the money in so houston did they don't play when it comes to like the schooling and having the police and that was one thing about it but not every city in Texas is afforded that opportunity when it comes to like having, you know, adequate, you know, and proper uh, security at school. And so there are some areas, you know, in the state of Texas that, that need that. But I will say this in Houston, they don't play that out here, <laughs> especially, you know, with the, with the truancy. Um, I remember those days, you know, if you went in school or inside the building by, what, 706, they'll lock some doors on you. And you had to go to the front office. So and those are the metal detectors, and so I did appreciate that. But on the outside of it, that's why I had to keep my head on the swivel in the streets. Yeah, um, exactly. So, yeah, but it's just the way life goes, and, and you just gotta get in where you fit in. And where my out was, and my escapism was, was going through foster care. But that was, you know, some BS in itself because basically, you it's designed for you to get lost in the system. You, you don't even have a name. You have a case number. I, can, I can't even tell you how many cases that I had I, within those four years that I stayed in foster care. I know for sure, I think I went to like five foster homes and two shelters. By the time I graduated, uh, I had been to like these 16 schools throughout my, my entire elementary, elementary, middle, and high school. And that in itself made me, you know, a type of person who wasn't. I don't want to say hard to get along with in the, in the essence, but it just made me a hard person on the inside because I felt like it was no point in me getting to know people because I'm going to be gone soon. Be gone soon. So right. for me, coming out of that environment to where, you know, chaos was normal and being placed uh -huh. in foster homes. I was actually placed in good foster homes. 
Ali and Chew. If y'all can believe it, I was placed in nice foster homes for black good. foster parents yeah. who were educated, had nice cars and houses, and that made me realize, wow, it, that was the first time being exposed to that. I had all, I had only seen the ghetto side of you know black folks, so seeing the educated side, you know, well outside that, that inspired me. And I was like, wow, if they can do it, I can do it. And then I found out, you know, going to college was you know my 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 option right there, and so I took it. But in, in, in essence, with that, I ended up going to Sam Houston State University. That was a blessing in itself, you know, because within that opportunity, I got to travel abroad, and I went to South Korea for a semester, and, and within that opportunity, I got to travel abroad to eight other countries, and so that's where my travel bug was planned. I used to say it when I was little, I'm a travel, I'm a travel. I didn't even realize I, I was manifested until, you know, I yeah. grew up and understood what manifested wow. was. I used to say it all the time when I was little, I'm going to go to Bora Bora, I'm going to do this and that. And, you know, look at me now. I never knew how I was going to do it. I just knew that I was going to do it. I let God work out the kinks and just claim it. That's how I that's how I think of it now. Don't worry about the little kinks. Let God work that out. Just claim it and put your name on it. But um, as well as, you know, I started my own student organization title paid for it and so that's where my motivation speaking but you know was kind of we used to go to different high schools sharing the points of education as well as sharing my testimony with them and kids would come up to me afterwards and be like well I'm in the same situation I'm in foster care too I didn't know the state of Texas would pay for my tuition and I'm gonna go to college now I didn't know and so that right there that inspired me and then let me know that hey I got a story to chill to tell and it's going to inspire people and so Four years later, graduated, you know, with my bachelor's degree in national business. I got two minors in economics and, you know, business communications. Uh, fast forward a couple what years later. What made you want to study business? What, what, what made you... Say again. What made you want to study international business? Because I've always been a businesswoman. Even as a Girl Scout, I was a little hustler. I mean, I remember them days when they used to have us out in Fiesta, you know, selling the cookies. Yeah. And I just other <laughs> girls, man. There was some other girls that tried to come over there and tell me, you can't eat, you do all this and that. And next thing I know, she tried me. I took her cookie. She was giving me her little box. But, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, show you my gangster side, but I've always been a business woman. That's, you know, always been about the business. Always knew, you know, I was going to be my own boss one day. And so, like I said, manifest plan prepare. And so with college, I just knew that business was going to be my top tier, but also, uh, to, to set myself up and make sure I have other, you know, little niches, not just one, put all eggs in one basket, if you will, have other outs. And so I got my master's degree in entrepreneurship. I ended up getting my real estate license as well as my insurance license. And, you know, God's been so good to me, man. I'm an author. I do motivational speaking. I have my own YouTube channel. I travel all over the world, you know, been to 50 plus countries but until the pandemic. <laughs> but, you know, so that just goes to show you, you know, that there's power in your testimony. You know, everybody has purpose in life. You just have to, you know, take a step back and look at what it is. Even if it's starting out gritty and grimy, you know, how, how do you say it? Pressure, pressure turns, you know, cold yeah, to a diamond. Yeah. So just pressure makes diamonds. It busts pipes, but it also can make go. a diamond. Yeah, there you go. And, and so... With that being stated, all those blessings and accomplishments and notches I had under my belt, Ali issue, that didn't mean a damn thing because I was still dealing with, you know, issues that plagued my past and, you know, childhood trauma that, that carried over into my adulthood. Like I said, I was taken out of that environment, that chaotic environment, what I had known and what was normal to me, if you will. And so being taken out of that environment, it just it took it threw me back. I believe for me it was too good to be true. And so, uh, I'm sorry, give me one second. Hold on. Even though I had all those accomplishments, things from my past were still carrying over and I never really dealt with. It. You know, being shuffled around, feeling unwanted and unloved. And I, I, I decided I'm gonna, I must tell my whole truth. And I expect to have their privacy, but I'm gonna speak my truth. I, at times I hold back because I always respect their privacy. And one day, I mean, they go around my tail. This is my truth and I'm gonna live it. Um, over to this is one who dropped me off at a house and left there. Oh, so and at what point did you realize that, you know, mental health may be a problem and that you may need to seek someone and, and speak about this? Get into that, yeah. So all those issues and coming back in mm -hmm. after, you know, I graduated and got all these accomplishments, 
I'm, I'm still having those those characteristics to where I, I was self sabotaging because I, again I believe the things uh-huh. it was too good for me to be true. So all throughout high school and you know being in foster care, I was self sabotaging because I just didn't think it, I I was worthy of and deserved it. And so with that, it carried over into my adulthood to where there was one incident. It was many of them, but there was this one that just stuck with me to where I had a meeting with a, a well connected person, and I purposely you know let well, I let those demons get in the back of my head telling me, you know, I'm not good enough. They don't, you know, they just have you know, pity on you. And so I would let those demons in the back of my head get to me and just, it, it, I purposely showed up like that meeting into where you left for sour taste in their mouth. And for years, I just sat back on that and thinking like, wow, I messed up. And so thinking about that and other uh, things that I messed over, that's looking myself in the mirror and facing that ugly truth and just saying, Whatever I went through in my childhood, whatever I went through in my past, it was out of my control. It wasn't my fault. But as an adult, it's on me to deal with. It's my problem to go and fix. And so I just missed that notion that, you know, black people don't do therapy. And I just said, you know, bump that. This black girl going to do some therapy. And that's just what I did. <laughs> um, and it wasn't until, like, after the pandemic or around the pandemic, I actually started to get serious with it and be consistent with it. And I'm glad I did because, you know, getting my mental health in check is what led to me writing the book and, you know, starting my business and, you know, the YouTube channel and, and so much more. So, you know, I, I definitely like to advocate and push for others out there that's going through any type of trials and tribulations or, you know, suffering from any traumatic past to face that the truth and just say, you know, hey, whatever it is that I went through in life, Whoever fault it was, whoever problem they caused on, uh, it on, it's on me to fix. And so mm-hmm. you have to uh, take that notion and just you have that courage to dismiss, you know, whatever you know, notion or rumors people say, especially you know in our work community that you know we not allowed to you know express our feelings or share what I was taught, you know, what goes on in this house stays in this house. And so you know that for a lot of us is taught there. Yeah, you know, if, if somebody touched you, you know, you know, they get mad at you for telling, you know, that's how it was in, in my culture. I won't say the family, but my culture and my environment, you know, you get mad, even though you're the victim, you know, yeah. you went wrong. Yeah. It's your fault. You did something. You was acting fast. You was doing this and that. You enticed them. That's you know? wild. <laughs> so that's how it is. But I want to take this time and, and say for anybody out there that's listening, black, white, Mexican, you know, short, fat, tall, gay, straight. I don't give a damn. Just know that whatever, you know, mental health or issues that you're going through, please know that it is okay to not be okay, but just don't sit there and not be okay. Go get help. Whatever the case is. Don't suffer in silence. Exactly. You know, talking with a therapist, a family member, a friend, picking up a hobby, you know, mending broken bridges, cutting people off, even if getting on medications, what you need to do. Do it, you know, do whatever it is that you guys have to do to keep your mental health in check and keep you from going off the deep end and possibly taking anybody with you. I realized that that I never really understood that notion, Ali, that, you know, hurt people, hurt people until I realized how hurt I was and it was affecting others. I was, I was projecting it on others. So definitely, when you know, your, your mental health isn't in check and you can, you know, go off the deep end, you may take somebody with you. You hear about it all the time, you know, kids getting bullied. And they go back into the school and, you know, try to get one person that's bullying them and take out, you know, 10 other innocent people that had nothing to do with it. And so that's definitely why it's important to keep your mental health in check. And again, for anybody out there that's going through any mental health, you know, issues or anguish, I want to share these mental health resources with you. And if you know anybody out there that needs it, please feel, to, feel free to share with them. The crisis hotline number is 1-800-273-8255. Or you can call or text 988 988- or you can text 741-741, or for those that would prefer to go online, you guys can check out mentalhealthishealth.com, or you can visit 988lifefund.org. For, for those that are outside the U.S. that's watching the Young Boys After 5 podcast, y'all go check out encouncelling.com, so E-N-C-O-U-N-S-E-L-I-N-G.com. And remember, you guys, although I am giving you guys these mental health resources, you have to own her work and find what works best for you because at the end of the day, you're the captain exactly. of the ship. You're the one that decides to navigate the waters, nobody else. <clears throat> Lastly, when it comes to like mental health check, 
I want you guys to remember and know that whatever trial and tribulation that you guys are going through, this too shall pass, but you will get through it. So going off the deep end, it's not an option. It's not worth it, so don't do it. Yeah, I digress. As long as you're breathing, you got an opportunity and a chance. No yeah. matter how hard it is, you can overcome. Yeah, you know, right. every Wednesday in our panels, we always present a black person uh, or a person of color that has made a difference in uh, the black culture of black black community. And I always particularly choose a person that arrived from slavery, that made millions of dollars you know, either going slavery to freedom or uh, soon after they were free from slavery and went on to make millions of dollars. So, step and fetch it. <laughs> step and what, what, what you say? I'm, I'm thinking of the first black millionaire, and that would be step and fetch it. I don't, I don't know who the uh, the first black millionaire is, but do elaborate because. Uh, Step and fetch, and what did they do? Because I've heard that term, and I'm want to know how do they equate step and fetch in, in the corporate world? Because right now it's not a positive thing. It never was. Uh, so step and fetch was a black actor, one of the first black actors um, doing a mystery uh, phase. They used to do the black face when uh, step and fetch was the first black actor to get on and play those. I don't, I don't like that word, the R word, but uh, those non-smart roles, you know, he looked very sluggish and slowish, and you know, just, yes, yeah, some houses and I was a cup, and he was just you know, mm -hmm. the monkey on the tightrope, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when you hear somebody say in step and fetch, and that means being, you know, the white people's monkey. But all you want about step and fetch, even though he played those roles, every role that he played in Hollywood was that, that that dumb nigga role. Sorry to say that. I'm sorry if you know my language too intense. But that role, causing him playing those roles, is what made him a millionaire. And he was the first black millionaire in America. Well, the point with our people, one of I try to address with our people is we look down on step and fishing because of the occupation that he showed. But like you said, we don't look at how many families and how many other businesses and benefits because of him sacrifice and playing that role that he played. We don't know how other many people that you look up to benefited off of him. So was he really stepping, fetching, and setting out, or was he doing what he had to do to get the culture over? And that, I think that's that. I think that. he realized it at that time, but if he was alive today, because the thing is, the difference between now, if you go back and you look at Martin Luther King, when Harry Belafonte and all of those actors during that time period, he was telling them, don't come down here and don't join the march. We soldiers, we gonna get beat up, we gonna take the hits in the march, but we gotta eat and we need money. You stay in front of them cameras and keep supporting us like you doing and let the street soldiers get out there in the street. And do what we do, and do what we do, and that's how the movement was able to make change and to keep going. Nowadays, we don't believe in that mentality. Everybody got to be a soldier. We don't think about okay, you need a backfield. You know, even when you go to war militarily, not everybody is on the front line fighting. You need support staff. We don't have military-minded strategies, I don't think, in this day and age. And this is one of the reasons why it sounds good, but it runs out of steam. Yeah. But what I can say about this generation, Ali, is that slowly but surely, and, and I, I, that's good that we be talking about, you know, the specifics of you know racism and slavery because that's what I actually I wrote my book on, uh, in regards to you know slavery and in the form of reverse racism. Um, it's titled "What If a Controversial Book coming Paradox. out about racism and corporate, so we we'll have to talk. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, grab or something. Gotta get, get, get your copy of the mind again. So, what if the controversial paradigm shift is a book that I've written to encourage and inform thoughtful provoking conversations about injustice and systemic racism in America? And I've done this through graphic and provocative illustrations. And so, I have also had it set up in four main paradigm shifts. We have historical, political, precedent, and hypothetical. And within each four paradigms, I'm asking the basic questions: What if? You know, basically, if this was your people and this happened to your people, or if this will still happen to your people, how would you feel then? So, for example, and when you open up 
YouTube historical paradigm, one of the first uh, questions that I ask is, what if in 1619 Africans started dealing in illegal slave trade, whereas they kidnapped millions of English men, women, and children and brought them to America on slave ships? And then you see that provocative, you start provoking illustrations where you have white slaves and sla in, ch in shackles and chains, and one of them jumped from the ship, and then you have a black slave ship masters, you know, whipping them, just like how they did us. And so I have it set up to where it's controversial, but it gets your attention. It, it, it pulls you to that round table so that we can have these conversations that need to be had and that are often swept under the rug and people like to turn a blind eye to. And, you know, I'm well aware that, you know, change doesn't happen overnight. It takes more than one person, you know, griping and complaining, you know, it, it's, it, but however, you know, what if, you know, Shu and Ali, this was a generation that planted the seed for the next and, and nothing beats a failure but a try. And so as well as I also want to say that this book it's not about, you know, well, it will piss some people off. It's not about, you know, well, you know certain things are piss people off. Like using this as a tool to incite our people to, you know, get upset with the whites. No, it's not that at all. Uh, so this book is just uh, simply meant to, you know, push that envelope, you know, and get you to have those conversations that need to be had, as well as, you know, as, as um, how my, uh, I, well, I learned from number 45, uh, um, you know, this man was in the office and he caused all this ruckus. And from him, you know, he he still had people fighting for him, no matter what. And so that was 75 million people, you know, condoning him. And that taught me, you know, that was 25% of the U.S. adult population. And so what I learned from number 45 and, and others is that you go where you celebrate it and not where you tolerate it. And, if, you know, no matter what you sell it to the public, no matter what you put out, no matter who you are, it's just going to be people out there that's going to condone you and support your BS. Uh, uh, not throwing no shade, but uh, let's talk about this new artist, uh, Sexy Red. Hey, I'm not judging you, but, you know, as you can see, it's some people that don't like her, but she got enough people that's rolling for her to where it's, she's pushing her to where she needs to be. And so that, again, shows to me no matter who you are, no matter what you to the public, be who you are, be yourself. And it's gonna be people riding for you no matter what. So with this book, I'm gonna go where I'm celebrated and not where I'm tolerated. Yeah. What is <laughs> what's your response to those that say, well, everybody has slaves? <laughs> you know. I'm so sorry, can you say that again? What is your response to those that say, well, everybody has slaves? Well, my response is everybody wouldn't have slaves if it wasn't for white folks teaching them how to own slaves. And you got to remember how the slave trade started. It started with the Portuguese learning and teaching others how to, you know, trade and, and the, work the kidnapping. <clears throat> as well as one thing that I hear with this book is that, well, black people own slaves. Africans kidnapped their own people and sold them into slaves. However, mm -hmm. they did any of that had not the white folks taught them how to do that. It was the Portuguese that came over and, you know, basically trick some tribes. They got, they, they bribe some tribes, you know, with silk and spices and minerals and other things that Africa, Africa didn't have. And so that's how they was able to infiltrate other tribes and get them to kidnap our people, as well as, you know, eventually assimilate into the safe trading, you know, occupation. And so to answer your question, I leave my thought on that is that wouldn't have started had, you know, white people, you know, live the match. <laughs> now, some will go a little bit deeper on today, and when you start talking with, uh, I, I call them the, uh, I want to say Egypt, top Egyptologists, what's the uh, comedic sciences type people and the chemic type people, they will go back and they will tell the story that, yeah, although the Portuguese, the Portuguese actually did not teach them slavery, they actually learned the, the stuff from the Moors. They went over into Europe. That's yeah, like we do today. The Moors left from the sacred teachings of Africa and got drunk and started screwing the white women and started getting with the lips and teaching sacred stuff that should have never been taught. And next thing you know, they took that knowledge. And when Europe came out of the Dark Ages, they vowed never to go back to that again. And that was one of their defense mechanisms when they came over and they, and they actually learned that from us. And then so I'm going to take it back to the Egypt, where the Egyptians owned slaves and everything. Now, my response to 
American slavery is this. As a matter of fact, slavery is still going on to this day. Mm-hmm. Slavery has never stopped. Even, even in the U.S., you know, you go to jail, you consider considered a slave. And so that's why they're putting a lot of us in jail for basically nothing. We're the most, the United States jail, the, jail more than anyone else in the world. So we still got slavery going, and then there's still sex slave, sex trading slaves. We still got, even in Africa, you still got people mining for diamond, diamond slaves, and the De Beers, and uh, what's the mineral? Uh, I can't think of the mineral that they make the cell phones in. So slavery's still cobalt. going. Cobalt. Cobalt, cobalt, you call it? Yeah, cobalt. cobalt. So we still got a lot of slavery going on. It never, never stopped. The thing that I push back and when people say, well, everybody has slavery and slavery is still going on, but I would ask, especially if they are non-melanated, do you know who your great-grandfather is? Can you tell me the story how your great-grandfather came to this country? Oh, yeah, you know, my great-grandfather was Irish. He came to here with $20 in his pocket. He worked in a store, and he, he slept on, he worked his way up, and he, he built a, a store, and he sent my you know, great whatever to to college, and this is how we came here. Well, I can't tell that story. Matter of fact, I don't even know where the hell I've been to. I can't go back to a tribe in Africa. The difference between me being a slave, and when I say me and my people, Americans, Mar- and even, uh, yeah, Americans and even some of the, uh, the islanders in slavery is you strip me from my name, my religion, and everything. I think if I went back to Africa today, I can't trace back where the hell I went to. Now they got some DNA test, twenty three and me say, but it's a broad general. Them I shit's trash. Yeah, it's trash. Yeah. It, it, I it, did it's a history general test general. one time. <laughs> I'm forever lost, and not only am I lost when you took me, I've been my my bliss line been raped and di- and, and uh, diluted. Diluted. That's yeah. what I'm looking at. I've been raped and diluted so much. So, hell, when you do a DNA test on on me, my bloodline points to hell. It may point to India. It it points to Japan. It points to Africa. It points to Europe. It points every damn where. And it's just all over the damn place, and I'm mixed up. I'm a lot. And so when people say, well, what are you? I have to say I'm lost because I don't know my beginning. I don't know I am. I am one of the lost tribes of Israel. I don't know where I came from. I, I I don't know who my original people are, my my bloodline, and I can't follow that. Hell, I was given the last name, but hell, that was a slave master's name, and I don't know my true self of being. And then I was given a religion, and I was given an education. <laughs> I'm the same person that 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 uh kidnapped me and, and, and my people and indoctrinated me. Is deal. So yeah, this is very much needed. And a lot of black people got to realize, wait, a lot, I will credit just Gen Z. Now they don't do a lot of that I agree with, right? But there is a lot of knowledge of self that's coming about. But but I think it's, it's, it's the creed as we move into this Aquarian age. And so, you know, you look at Indy, and I know part of us are Indian. And don't even realize if we don't know who, who of us originated here is Indians, American Indians, and, and who came from Africa. And then yeah, we I call me. I can share to my family. But they're, yeah, they're, even the Indians yeah. turned around and, and, and had slaves, uh, and, and enslaved some of us with tribes. And all the good things that we've done seem to miss history. You know, a, a lot of people think that we were, oh, I get it. They said we should be thankful for slavery because slavery gave us a religion and civilized us. But did I not point in one of our previous episodes, did I not point a a post a church in Ethiopia that was before uh, religion, uh, the BC, where it was crossed. They had a church in the shape of a cross built in the rock down. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that's why I had to lose the religion in itself. Like I don't, I, even when you talk about religion, I hear you, but again, it don't apply to me because I just lost it. <laughs> For me, again, it's right. it's so many out there, it's so diluted. It, it, exactly. It, 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 it has now, basically. It's so, that's the, but that's a church. That that that's the excuse that the the, the church has taught us. Well, 
Slavery was bad, but it gave you Jesus. Okay. No. Yeah, we were not, no, no, not barking at trees. The people were not. Yeah, and our people were not barking at trees and didn't have a sense of culture and religion. If you go back and you read the temples, your Moses stole ten of the laws with his ten commandments. But I'm not gonna go there. Yeah, and well, then you should be taking the scripture. And, and, yeah. and being in, you know, Egyptian Museum and seeing, you know, Ramses II and Nefertiti's sculpture, you, it's clear that you could tell that they were black. They had nothing but, you know, the black features and nose and everything. And they tried to cover it up and, 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 and sugarcoat it. But if you actually go there, like I've been there uh, and, and see their, their pictures and their statues, I've actually seen Ramses' casket and took a picture of it and, and, and can't go over and touch it. They have it blocked off. But I've seen it, and and when I was there, I just felt like home. Like I, I was reminded that you know I have blood of kings and queens flowing through my veins, and so I encourage all our people. You know, if you ever get a chance to, if they say go back to Africa, I say choose Egypt. That's what we. That's what we want to remind yourself where your bloodline is. If you ask, you know, what's my bloodline? I'm lost. I don't know. Go back to Egypt, and you'll find it. Um, also, but, Ethiopia. But people sleep on Ethiopia and don't realize that Ethiopia was America and had tombs and stuff going on there. They also forget about Iraq, which was the, yeah. what predated yeah. Egypt. Yeah. Yeah. A lot yeah. of people still got a lot of learning because they, they, we talk about the Ten Commandments and we don't realize that there was actually 42. Yeah, oh, yeah, 42 right. principles of mind. 42 laws of mind, or the negative confession. I've heard it is 42 laws of mind. And what is it, the negative confessions? Yeah, or ISIS papers. The ISIS papers and the negative, yeah. the 42 negative confessions, which Christianity took 10 of them to make the 10 commandments. Yeah. But you know, also with the Bible, again, I, I hate going to religion because I'm not a religious person. I try, I, don't, I try to stay away from religion and politics. But if it goes there, oh well. But, you know, religion, well, but sometimes it's religion. I always say because religion, but then it's the truth. Now. Yeah. And people will, and it's not to put anything down. You believe in what you, if you believe it, you believe in it. I am not here to argue with anyone on their beliefs and everything. Believe what you believe. But like I tell people, where's King Solomon Temple? Well, uh, you know, he got, it, it, it got destroyed. Where's the cross? That you, well, you know, it, it got, it got this and that. I can tell you, well, after not, we ain't got a debate on that. Just, we can go and find King, you seen King Ramses. You, we, we know who King Ramses' daddy was. It was King Atenaten. The one who came up with the one sun god. Huh? It's not mentioned. <laughs> the, the one god deal, everything else. And I'm saying, when you trace back them, you can go. And if they let you in, you go and you read. The, and those that can, can uh, translate and read the walls, all that is still there. To oh, the yeah. I've seen it. It's there. I believe you. I've seen it. Right are you, are you, are you, are you, you know what I'm saying? When they say, can I get a witness in church? I mean, That's you don't cool. tell me those people didn't have no religion, but they can line a damn pyramid up with the damn stars and the star constellation. We can't do that to this day. You're living in different times. We can't do what they've done. Huh? I said, she have been quiet. Oh, what do I have to say? Ha <laughs> ha. That's funny. Uh, we talking about my life, essentially. We're talking about things that I've done. So me sitting here, I'm just, you know, soaking it up. But as far as um, this particular context, I really don't feel too much about it because these cycles, they come and go. This shit is a repeat. Everything is just cycles. So whenever we talk about slavery, to me, it's just kind of like a joke because a lot of this shit has been covered up. Most of it has been covered up. Like, most of us never actually came from Africa. Most of us came from here. Like, America. A lot of shit been switch swapped. A lot of names been changed, you know. Uh, I was speaking with Ali yesterday, or I think on our panel, talking about Christopher Columbus. Like, that's not even his real fucking name. Uh, Just shit like that. You know what I'm saying? Um... Knowing about, like you mentioned in the Portuguese, like a lot of people don't know, they talk about religion, but the Pope is the, the motherfucker that sanctions slavery. You know, the Pope passed 
basically a law saying that you can go below the Cape of Bojador, and that's in Western Africa, near Senegal. You go past the Cape of Bojador, you kidnap any motherfucker you want. So when, when you talk about slavery, oh. you're talking about the past, and I'm a present type of person, so I really don't give a fuck about this, to be honest like with that. you. <laughs> And at the same time, you talk about America, most people don't realize you go to the Grand Canyon, there's pyramids in the canyon. Yeah, there are. Egyptian names that they don't allow you to go, they won't allow you to go to that point to even discover some of this stuff. True. Oh. I actually have a friend that went to the, she lives there. Right, so moving forward, that's what I'm saying, but in, in the essence of moving forward, it's, it's also kind of like a catch-22 because in the presence of what we live in, you still got, you know, killings of unarmed black men and, and women and even not, not necessarily just black people, innocent people. You still have pe- uh, uh, people with authority, like police officers, some of them, not all, who abuse their powers of authority. And so as far as, you know, the past goes, that situation is in the past, but what about the present things that we're still dealing with now? And so... For me, it's, it's not shit of the past. It's things that's in the press that's still, you know, bugging the fuck out of me. It make me feel like, well, damn, what if all the shit that we did to y'all, you know, from what y'all did to us from the past to the present to the future, what if we did this to y'all? How would y'all feel? And, again, a lot of the questions I get from the other side, some some other, you know, people, non-colored people agree, but, you know, you still have those groups that like to deflect and, you know, make excuses to one, you know, I had an argument. I don't want to say argument. I say debate. Yeah. About you know the door boy, and again, clearly seeing this cop, you know Derek, uh, what's his? I don't even want to say his name. The cop, he you mm-hmm. know had his knee on his dude's knee for over eight. You've seen this on video, and you still have people making that excuse. Well, he was resisting. He was on fentanyl. He was a thug. Why, why, why are we discussing? My my thing is, why are we even discussing that with the other race? Because we need to have those conversations. And with wow. my book, the way that I have it is that if they're going to turn the blind eye, we're going to put it in their faces. We're going to make but them happy. Why not just stand up and say, well, I ain't going for it no more? See, so now you speak. I said this book and how I have it is. That's, that's my thought process of saying, you know, we're not like, taking this no more. Or are we going to start giving you a dose of We're not necessarily giving a dose of Because I don't, I don't, again, this book is not meant to, you know, incite violence or, you know, <laughs> Or any violence on, on, on anyone, it's like this. I wish nothing but love, peace, and happiness for anybody. And that's how I live my life. I am not a violent person. Let me set this alarm tonight and go to sleep, and you come into this house. Nothing less than death will you meet. Nothing less than kill me first. There will be nothing less than death once you cross that line and you come in here and get that alarm. There is I no negotiation. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and that's the thing. Yeah, I am for it. There are great people out there. If I am, um, you know, like I go out for a walk uh, 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 all the time. I'm home, I'm armed. You know, I don't want no problems. I, I'm not looking for no smoke with nobody. Now, should you think I don't belong in this neighborhood and you decide that you want to pursue me like some people done in Georgia on what a young man that was going through the neighborhood and I see a weapon, I will defend myself. There is no negotiation there. There's nothing I don't need you to agree with my side and I'll accept the consequences. If you should mess with my child, if my child should be unjustly targeted or you know, a family member or whatever in that deal, then I don't need a judge. Hey, I feel that. I feel the same way. And, and I don't want to say this, but this, this is what we call out here, shooting on Texas, so everybody packed it. And so yeah. in, in Texas. I think about you. Oh, so we got it all out here. But in Texas, how it goes, everybody watches where they sit because they know somebody somewhere packed. And so... Uh, uh, we, are, we are defending against ourselves. We uh, pack guns in the hood and everything else to defend our life against another me. So if I come into fourth ward, fifth ward, fourth ward or whatever, and they don't know my face or whatever, I'll, who is he? And he, he don't look familiar or whatever. I don't think he belong here. Oh, he just got a gold shirt. I, I don't know who he is. I don't know. We got to check that fool out. You know what? And he got some joints on. He, he think he's somebody. 
know what? I might have to smoke that fool. You know, he looking there. He better not disrespect and say something. Uh, I got to get him. So with me walking in the fourth ward, yeah, it's a problem. You defending it. I, I'm no threat. Well, well, some of us may be. But I'm easily to be the target and to be smoked in there. Now, yeah. when, when somebody with, with a certain thing on their thing, one of them will walk in your hood and fifth ward, and everybody sit back and they hold up. There goes somebody coming. There, there, there goes somebody coming. Yo, yo, chill, chill. Here, here comes so and so. He coming through there. I'm in jail. Don't do what I'm supposed to. So when so and so pull up, hey, boy, come in. If you don't run, your option there is to either run or if he do get you, oh, man, come on, man, where you messing me? I ain't done nothing. Hey, man, here's a crowd. Hey, leave him alone. That ain't right what y'all doing to him. Uh, oh, 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 you know, don't do him like that. Oh, yeah, you, y'all, y'all shouldn't do him like that or whatever. That's messed up what y'all doing him. And I'm going to record this. Oh, yeah, this this is going viral. Why, why? I don't get that same appreciation. That's all I'm saying. I don't advocate violence. I'm just saying. When George Floyd died, you know, it was a crowd. Yeah, and that's, that's that, but. Saying. His, his, I will say this for George. His death wasn't in vain. Well, first of all, let me say this. I'm still stuck on the fifth ward. First of all, ain't no cops coming through fifth ward because they already know. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say. No. But second of all, with, somebody, with George Floyd, I would say his death wasn't in vain because something came out of that. A change came out of his death. And it's unfortunate that it cost him his death. But finally, if it was just one time, Somebody was held accountable for the wrong. It, it finally, it, finally, that's how I felt when you know that the police officer was sentenced. It was like, wow, we need more of that. And then now that I've seen that it's possible, this is just the beginning. And so, what I will say from that is that it's unfortunate that it happened, but sometimes, every, not sometimes, everything happens for a reason, and, and God can turn tragedy into a triumph. So. I still think, you know, the best is yet to come. We're just getting started. We got, you know, such a long road to go. But it's it's gonna take all of us. Coming race. To that. Do any other race have, have do, do any other race in the US have this problem? Well, now, you know, they got a little info commercials with the attacks on, you know, Asian culture and do any other race do any other race have this problem in, short, in the United States? No. 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 No, they don't. In short, so they don't. Why in the hell do it take us so damn long? <laughs> you said it earlier, the system. But with I, that to answer that well, question. Well, I tell you why. Well, if you listen to Martin Johnson, he said because some of them got countries that will back them up. But what they keep quiet is Cal. Okay, let's go back. I think it was, was it Arizona, California, somewhere? A biker gang. A white biker gang. Uh, Texas, I think it was. No, Texas, I think it was. I have to Google it. I can't see. They went into a bar, shot the whole damn bar up in a damn yeah. They got shooting in like the bar. So yeah. Cody, everybody, everybody. Not one person went to jail. Nobody went to jail. Yeah, I think I remember that. Yeah, it was like the bike ball. Now, yeah, it was on the news, yeah. Yeah, it was on the news and everything. It happened like in, uh, 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 like, not one. Texas. Now, back in the day, in Arizona, it used to be so bad where state troopers would pull over one Hispanic. He would get on his cell phone, call his boys, and some of this was gang stuff. While that trooper had him pulled up, his boys would come by and do a drive-by. Oh, wow. You put that in the that. Hell. And they, 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 they others, you, 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 you kill Jose, and there's going to be consequences. Yep. Well, there's consequences. They don't give a damn. <laughs> now, I'm but, not having violence or anything. I'm just stating the facts in the obvious. This is all, you know, no threat. This is, this is verifiable stuff, not stuff that I'm making up. Yeah. Goes out there that's missing. But you're right, we do need to have a conversation and I do want to check out your book. Tell us where we can get your book at. Sure, definitely. You guys can check out my book and get your copy of my book at my website, differenceworld.net. Again, that's spelled D I F E R N T S 
W-O-R-L-D dot net. You guys can check out my social media handles, including my Instagram, my TikTok. I'm not on Twitter, though. They can change Twitter to X something, so, you know. Yeah, it's X now. Then they so, talk about Facebook. <laughs> I don't know Twitter or Facebook, but uh, definitely I try to drive all the traffic to my YouTube. Uh, definitely hit that subscribe button. On, with my YouTube channel, I talk about different content. Mondays, we do motivational. Tuesday, social awareness. Wednesdays, I drop my interviews. Thursday, I do my pop culture reviews, and on Fridays, I do my travel vlogs. So, if you guys want to check out all the places I've been so far that I've uploaded, I think I got like eight of my places, or the 20, 20, 20 of my places. I'm about to drop my Cuba one soon. I'll be dropping that tomorrow. I always wanted to go to Cuba. I'm a little jealous there. Yeah, I can't go back there. <laughs> I'm probably on a water poster or something. Woo! But uh, <laughs> I had so much fun out there, just living life, man. I, I've been all over the world, and and. Even with that, I just want to say, with, with traveling and having nice things and fancy things, money doesn't buy happiness. If you're not happy within and having your mental in check and having your mind in with your heart, anything that's coming to you in life, you're not going to appreciate it. At times, you're going to squander it. And so it's very, very important to, you know, when, once you're going out, before you go out for what's yours, get your mental health in check. So you fix yourself from the inside out. Like I said, my motto is manifest, plan, prepare. And, and what I mean by this is the first step when it, when it comes to that is to remove all doubt, all fear, all naysayers, and replace it with, you know, positive affirmations and get it in your mind and start seeing it before you receive it. Next step is to plan for it. Get it out on paper. You know, write out how you're going to attack your plan of achievement and how you're going to achieve that goal. Have a backup plan, an exit strategy. You can't plan for the unknown, but you can expect that it is coming and whenever it does, Remember, whatever trial and tribulation you're going through, you a boss and you're going to get through it. And it, this too shall pass. And so once you have those two down pat, you move on to preparing yourself. When I say prepare, that means prepare from the inside out. Go fix your financial house. Go fix your physical house. Go get that gym up. Go mend those broken bridges. Go cut those people off that mean you know well. But whatever it is in life that you manifest it and prepare for, Whenever it, it comes to you, you can, you can be prepared for it. You won't squander it like how I did in my early 20s. I had so many good opportunities coming in my way, but again, I just didn't feel worthy of it, and I squandered it. And so the approach that I'm taking now in my 30s is just to manifest, plan, and prepare for every good thing that I want in my life that's going to come. It might not come overnight. It definitely won't come, you know, within, you know, a day or so, but it'll come to me. And especially, you know, with putting in heart, you have to also remember the second part, faith without work is dead. Dead. You can have all the faith you want. You can walk by faith and not by sight all you want. But if you don't put it in that work to, to offset that faith, then it, you know, whatever you're planning and, and, and manifesting for and being prepared for it, it's not going to come to you. And so definitely have those uh, mindset when it comes to you know manifesting, planning, preparing for whatever it is in life that you want, and it will surely come to you guys. Wow, that was awesome. You were definitely... Difference is a it's the right name for you because you are definitely a difference maker. Yeah, and motivation. Definitely motivational. Yes, I mean, know, I mean, like, and and I'm a perfect person. Don't get it twisted. I still got my flaws. I'm a work in progress, and we mm -hmm. all are. I, but with that being said, what I want my life to show before I leave out of here. I want my life to be seen as an example of how God can use, you know, his most flawed, flawful people and still, you know, take you from the back to the front. I've made many mistakes, squandered so many opportunities, you know, left a sour taste in a lot of people's mouths. But look at me, you know, look how much God has blessed me and, you know, the best is yet to come. And so anybody out there listening and watching, you know, just look at me and listen to my story and my background and where I come from and just see that, hey, no matter what you've been through in life, no matter, you know, what, what you're going through in life, it doesn't determine your destiny or your final destination. It's all on you. And that starts with getting your mental health in check and keeping it in check. That's also another thing you got to realize when it comes to getting your mental health in check. You got to be serious about it. It's just like when you decide to love physically, you know, lose, keep it off. You can't go back to that old life because what you do, it, it's just, it's going to be downfall from that. And so going to therapy is not just a one stop shop. A lot of people. I'm going to go to therapy one time and I'm going to be all right. No, it's a full on lifetime commitment to keep your mental health in check. And so once you start, you cannot stop. And and 
that's something to be, you know, once through before you get in and finally admit and, and accept that you need to get your mental health check. You have to be prepared and ready and mature for it. Sure. Take note of those numbers that she dropped. We have the links yeah. in the comment. Yeah. And I always yeah. get you. The yeah. You know, I know it by heart because I use these numbers. I, 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 I share this with you guys. You know, 2021 was the hardest year of my life. I lost five people back to back, back, including my mother being the last person. She died in my arms the day after Christmas, and that just took me out. And, you know, before she left, she, she made me promise me, you know, promise her not to go off deep end. So that immediately. With that, it was important to, you know, grieve right away and keeping my mental health in check. And I'm still grieving. I'm still going through it. You know, October 1st will be her birthday. She would have been 53. And, you know, what I'm going through in my mind now is like, damn, she should be here. And so every, you know, birthday, every, you know, that anniversary that come around, you know, I fight, you know, the feeling of, you know, I don't want to say suicidal thoughts, but how I feel about it is wherever my mom is at, I want to be with her. Just want to, you know, see her, you know, one more time, give her a hug one more time, you know, heaven or hell, wherever she's at, I want to be with her. But not necessarily saying, you know, go off the deep end and do yeah. so, but saying that to share with others because I know I'm not the only person going through it. And me mm -hmm. sharing it, 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 it lets me know I have so many people come to me and, you know, send me messages like, man, I didn't know you, you know, you, your story is my story. It's giving me hope. And so with sharing this with somebody, you know, that may be dealing with the loss of a loved one, like how I am. You know, I just want to give them hope and encouragement and letting them know that this, they will get through it, but it's going to take work and, and using, utilizing your tools. You know, get online. A lot of people say that they can't afford to go talk with a therapist. I understand. It's expensive. And so they're, don't they're let not money, cheap. Yeah, don't let money be the reason why you can't keep or don't keep your mental health in check or do something about your mental health. There are other resources out there, you know, getting online, finding free resources around your local area. Again, you guys just have to do your research and just find what works best for you. But don't let that ever, don't don't use any excuse. There's just too many options and alternatives out there for you. Be any excuse, unless you you know. I often tell people this too. You know, again, it's not your fault. It, it was it was out of your control. But somehow, some way, it's your problem to deal with. If you realize it's just a problem that you need to fix, and you don't want to go get it fixed, then it is your fault. That whatever's bringing and coming on to your life, you know, trial and tribulation. You're part of that problem now because if you know it's an issue and you don't want to get it fixed, then you deserve what you get. I'm a realist, you know. I don't even say, you know, try to hold back, back you know, be mindful, but it's, it's the truth. It's the ugly truth that, you know, what's a real, what's a realist, I, I gotta ask you, what is your sign? Say it again. What's your realness? I have to ask you, what is your sign? Well, I'm a Sag. Go uh, through. Okay, Sag. Yeah. yeah, I'm a fire. I'm, I, I am the smoke. Yeah, I'm an Aries. I come with fire. My nephew's Aries. Oh, Lord, Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Shoot, what are you? Scorpio? No. <laughs> no, oh. I mean, uh, if we're doing Western astrology, I'm a Taurus. If we're doing Eastern astrology, I'm Aries. Oh, Lord. Yeah. But, oh, Lord, I need the love. I need love. I'm about my money. I get the love after. <laughs> yeah. I like cool. Sagittarius. Y'all ruled by yeah. Jupiter, man. Jupiter's. Yeah. But you know, I, I want to state this. I know there's a lot of Sagittarius out there that cheat. I'm, I don't. I don't play. I mean, y'all expensive. I'm I'm supposed to cheat. I'm a flirt. I'm a flirt. <laughs> but once I'm with you, I'm with you. And so, anybody think as soon as I tell them I'm a Sagittarius, are y'all cheat? No, some of them are. Most of the men, and a little of the women. You know. But me, you know, I believe in loyalty. I, I was just raised around an environment where loyalty was everything, and you know, death before this loyalty. And if I'm with you. I'm with you. However, if I'm with you, I expect the same loyalty and respect it goes hand in hand. Where well, I'm gonna tell y'all something funny real quick. So, um, in tarot, they, you know, tarot cards have like images, and um, the card for Sagittarius is the Knight of Wands, which is like, you know. Knights are like kind of like a younger card, I guess. Whenever they uh, like are reading, it's usually supposed to be like a younger card. But the Knight of Wands to a lot of people who are like new to tarot, they consider it to be like the player card. So whenever. <laughs> yes, I'm a player. I'm yeah, a Mac. Exactly. Hey, I'm Mac a Mac yeah. International fat Mac. I do be Macking. I can't. All right. I, I, 
Hey, well, no, you said Sagittarius. I was like, oh, it. it's a fellow player in the building. <laughs> I can't help it. I can't help it. This is my blood, okay? This is my blood. That's, That's what's up, though. <laughs> I'm going to my blood, not relation. Not relation. Uh-huh. <laughs> nah, hey, look, me and, I, I wish M Red was here because when we was growing up, M Red is another one of our hosts. I, 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 I hate that notion, but it is true, you know, Sagittarius like to play a lot. Like me, like, you know, I like to do if I'm, I'm, you know, if I'm in a relationship, I don't, I don't, I'm with you. I, I respect my man's feelings, and you know, and I respect myself. So if I'm with you, I'm with. You. I can't, speak well, very very least, I can't stand anyone that bores the hell out of me. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't you stand know. boring. We don't do boring. Yeah. Well, no, I'm never boring. I'm I can't stand boring either. Are you boring? You talking about Ali? <laughs> I'm boring. Nah, we we the life. Boring? Which one of y'all boring? Nah, we the life of the party. Nah, we're not That's boring by uh, any stretch of the imagination. Like That's party. Yeah. Well, I, I like to have fun, but just not that fun that, that'll cost you or get you in jail. I ain't got time for that. So I no, no, like no. Have, that. That, 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 that. We're too grown for that. You know you know what I'm talking about. That ignorant shit. I ain't going to lie. Uh, I mean. You, 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 got, you with the shits, too? Yeah. You that's why that's, that's why I roll with Ali, because he going to keep me not in some shit. Oh, that's what's up. Yeah, but you I mean, your book? Uh, yeah, I bet so. your book got look like this. Nah, I actually have uh, never been to a prison. The only time I ever got almost got locked up, uh, this girl I was with, I don't know what she did, but I ended up not getting locked up. So, oh, no, yeah, that's funny that you said it. Cops pulled me over this early state, but thank god they let me go. Yeah, a blessing. I'm glad, yo, I'm glad you're here with us because that shit could have went left for real. So. I know, right? Yeah, it's a blessing. Looking out for your girl. But yeah, uh, I don't know. Y'all got any other questions for me, man? I, I haven't well, one thing that, that we, that we, well, go ahead, shoot. All right, so we asked all of our guests this question. When you hear the phrase after five, what do you think of? <sighs> Something freaky. I, I swear to y'all, when I see that game, five, I was like, hold on, is this this one? Because I told you, like, you got to watch where you go on. And then I had made the mistake of going on the podcast, and it was about, what's that, SMM, SMBDM, all that? Yeah, BDSM. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 BDSM, all that. Get your tied you up in this gotta, one. You got to warn somebody, bro. You can't just, you know, spurge on somebody or keep it secret until they come on the show. And then you be in a furry outfit. Come on now. Oh man! So, but nah, when I did after five, you know, I'm thinking, you know, after five, it get real live. So, you know, okay, hey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. You should. It, it's funny you should say that because you should have caught our our, our Wednesday panel. It kind of got rough when we was talking yeah. about uh, after five, and maybe we should make it some, and, uh, a dance club and, and everything. Oh, what did Fabo call it? Eastern Standard Time, we are. Uh, really, people that hit us up, like, hey, I, I want to jump on tonight. Oh, oh, oh okay. Okay, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I swear it's it's it go left so fast. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, we, we, we take it left sometime. It's like, okay, this is going right, but we're going to steer this left. This is all wrong. <laughs> Because I, I have to moderate. I'm a moderator. I really don't host 
but uh, since I'm here, you know, with Ali, I try, I try uh, to make sure that I, I'm giving with him. But to be honest with you, I don't be saying that. I really just be watching. I'm, I'm the observer. I'm like that too, but uh, sometimes I just gotta say, uh, hold on, whoa, 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 keep on stopping. (laughs) But yeah, yeah, that's what's up. Y'all don't want me to do that though. (laughs) Nah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm extreme, so I I tend to just not say shit because I'm, I'm hella extreme. Oh, okay. You let Ali do your dirty work. I mean, he do he extreme in a good way. I'm extreme to the point where I'd be like ready to piss motherfuckers off. So. Oh, Lord? Yeah, I don't say nothing. Yeah. Turn to little nah. That's what I'm saying. That's why I have to be with Ali, because he's going to keep me out of the shit, man. It give me, it give oh, me man, something to be positive. Doing, What's up? That's fine. Like, I used to hang with our other cousin, Sirsk. Yeah, Sirsk. Yeah, man. Sirsk be on that shit. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. That's we... I'm so proud of y'all. Let me just say this for y'all black men. You know, I, I will say this. We just put that out for all man stop that doing these things and just to give y'all y'all flowers man and just reminded of uh, y'all are kings and y'all wearing crowns in y'all head y'all rocking that shit also well keep doing that and, and keep doing y'all thing and, and elevating man i'm happy that i met y'all with this opportunity to come on and rock out with y'all i'm looking to back so you know just giving y'all y'all flowers and let go and keep doing y'all thing the things coming for y'all we appreciate that and, 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 and. What what you said is, what's the term I'm looking for, Shay? Gotcha. See, <laughs> uh, prophecy. <laughs> oh, and yeah, you're right. I'm speaking prophecy. That, that was pathetic. What you 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 just said, and we we received it. And I think we were having this conversation earlier today, and so it's just ironic that you you, you yeah. say that. Everybody been wanting to give us flowers all of a sudden, so it's like. Uh, Somebody uh, deserves it. Somebody yeah. do to you. Nah, but it's likewise, Again, God is for lost. real. Like, 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 you can't a lot of kings and queens. You got blood in your, your veins. There's that's, that's royalty. And so just just keep that mindset. Shit. I'm, even though you may not feel it or think it, your bank account may not reflect it. I feel like myself, I'm royalty. I don't give a fuck if I'm you know, not the baddest bitch. Now, I'm not a bad bitch. I'm a queen, first of all. And so mm-hmm. for me, how I view myself as royalty, even if I, I heard that shit. Exactly. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's no, what I know it's getting late, and this thing, we definitely appreciate you for coming on here. Difference, you're no. welcome anytime. Just you know, let us know. We you know, appreciate it. Probably not this weekend, uh, Wednesday, but whenever we, we definitely yeah. yeah. even if we are doing another interview. For sure, yeah, for sure. You guys can check out my website, differenceworld.net. And get my book, What If a Controversial Paradigm Chip, and all my other social media handles. And again, thank you for everybody out there listening and hearing my story and hopefully drawing inspiration from it. And just remember, whatever it is in life that you're feeling you're destined for, you have to manifest, plan, and prepare for it. And it will surely come to you guys. If it's well, I'm in my own. All right, everybody, welcome back. I hope you guys enjoy listening to my audio interview I did with the After Five, the podcast with the hosts, uh, Ali and Lord Shu. As you guys seen, uh, we shoot the breeze, you know, talking about my come up and my mission to, you know, uh, plant seeds of goodness in the world, as well as just inspiring and encouraging others to go after their dreams. And like I said, you know, manifest, plan, and prepare is my mantra, is what I live by. And so with 2024, uh, we just dropped our motivation vlog, you know, the year of the refund, getting your money back, taking back your power. Uh, a lot of big things are coming this year for me. I, I feel it. That's why I'm manifesting, planning, and prepared for it. And so if you guys like our interview and want to see more of my podcast interviews, show me by liking, sharing, commenting, and subscribing to my YouTube channel. I definitely appreciate all the love and support that I am getting. Please keep it coming and don't stop. Uh, moving on, what else we got going on? Uh, don't forget, check out my website, differenceworld.net. You can see what all I have going on there, including with my Instagram and my TikTok, uh, and as well as, uh, excuse me, as well as for those that's looking for anybody to do motivational speaking at their events, podcasts, interview collaborations like this one, or uh, just looking to join any type of grassroots conversations, get at you, girl. I am free of charge as of now. Just go to my website, differenceworld.net, and book me there. Or you can look at me, or excuse me, get at me online, send me a DM or an email. I ain't hard to find. <laughs> Just come and learn. 
All right. And so with that, thank you guys again for all the love and support. I appreciate it. Please keep it coming. Um, I don't want to put like an instrument of gold on me when it comes to like building my subscribers for this year. Um, I'm just going to say I'm, I'm going to try to double up and like I said, anything is possible, especially when you manifest and prepare for it. And I'm a strong believer of, you know, knowing how God can take you from the back to the front just like that. So with it, you know, I know that it's going to happen one day. I know that it's not going to happen overnight, but it's been just about two and a half years since I've had this YouTube channel. So I got a feeling I'm about to go this. So watch and see. <laughs> so again, that's why you guys got to hit that like, share, comment, and subscribe button to help get your girl there, yeah? Um, as well as, don't forget, check out my website for my book, What If? A Controversial Paradigm Shift. Again, this book was written to encourage and inform thoughtful open conversations about injustice in America. And I've done this through graphic and provocative illustrations. So again, be advised that this has sensitive content. It's intended for a mature audience. And so if you can't take this type of content, Still come on to the kitchen. All right, uh, you just get your little fire for You say, you can't take this heat. Still come on to the kitchen, you know. Uh, that's the point of it all is to have these conversations that need to be had that are often swept under the rug and turn the blind eye to it. And the way that I've set this book up, it's been in a manner to, yeah, I've chose the controversy, right? Because I've, I've realized that controversy is what people flock to faster than, you know, what's real and what's necessary. And so once I get your attention with that, you know, attention grabber, you come and learn about what's the real uh, meaning of the book. And so, again, go to my website, differenceworld.net, and you get your copy of my book, What If a Controversial Paradigm Shift. And again, thank you guys so much for all the love and support, those that are, you know, putting in their orders for it. Uh, thank you so much. Again, once you receive it, you know, review and share it with your friends and uh, get the word out about it. Um, and so, again, hit up my website and get your copy of my book. Yeah. All right. What else we got going on? Moving right along. What's up, what's up, what's up? Uh, tomorrow's Thursday, so, you know, on Thursdays we do our pop culture reviews, our movie reviews. Um, trying to figure out which one I want to do. I just recently went to go see The Color Purples. And I'm going to let y'all know right now, I got a lot to say about that. Um, some good, some bad, so just be prepared for whenever I drop that. I don't know if I'm going to drop it tomorrow or whenever, because I also went to go see Aquaman 2. Um, but again, that's why you guys got to hit that uh, notification bell and that subscribe button, so when I drop the content, you guys come into Difference World and you come and learn, yeah? And with that being said, you guys, let's go ahead and do our mental health check for those out there that may need it, including myself, anybody going through any type of mental anguish, including depression, having suicidal thoughts, anxiety attacks, uh, even dealing with, you know, bullying or having drug relapse, please know that it's okay to not be okay, but don't ever sit there and not be okay. Go get help, whatever that may mean to you, be it talking with a therapist, a family member, a friend, uh, um, a confidant, whatever that may mean to you, picking up a hobby, uh, mending broken bridges, cutting people off, getting on medication if that is the case for you, do whatever it is that you have to do to keep your mental health in check and keep you from going off the deep end or possibly taking anybody with you. If you need or if you know anybody who may need these mental health resources, please feel free to share it with them. The crisis hotline number is 1-800-273-8255. Or you can call or text 988, or you can text 741-741. And for those that would prefer to go online, you guys can check out mentalhealthishealth.us, or you can visit 988lifeline.org. Or for those that are outside of the U.S. and is watching your girls' YouTube channel, you guys can visit mcounseling.com. And remember, you guys, although I am giving you these mental health resources, it's on you to do your own homework and find what works best for you. Because at the end of the day, you're the captain of the ship, your own ship, and you decide where to navigate the waters. Nobody else. And with that being said, when it comes to your mental health, I want you guys to remember whatever trial and tribulation that you are going through at this time in your life, this too shall pass and you will get through it. So going off the deep end is not an option. The boy is not worth it. So don't do it. Okay. All right, you guys. So with that being said, we're going to move right along and uh, close out this video. I hope you guys enjoyed uh, with my first uh, podcast interview of the year. Many, many more to come. Again, show me if you guys enjoyed by hitting that like button, that sharing, and then commenting. And definitely, don't forget, hit that subscribe button and that notification bell. So when I drop the content, you come into Difference World and you come and learn what's going on with your girl. Yeah. And with that being said, you guys, whatever it is in life that you're feeling you're destined for, don't forget, you have to manifest, plan, and prepare for it. And it will surely come to you guys. 
Peace. 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 What if? What if in 1619 Africans started dealing in slave trading? The tables were turned around. What if they kidnapped millions of Englishmen, women, and children from their homeland and brought them to America on a slave ship? What if a controversial paradigm shift is a book written to inform and encourage consistent, thought-provoking conversations about injustice and systematic racism in America through graphic but provocative illustration? What if provides a different perspective by detailing controversial deaths and events as four categorized paradigm shifts, historical, political, precedent, and hypothetical? What if? A controversial paradigm shift by author Different. Go to differenceworld.net.